Now better? OK. OK, so hi, I'm Ina. Um, I have a hope that this morning left you all motivated. Because uh, right now, I'm not going to be giving any motivation whatsoever. I'm just going to be giving technical stuff that will hopefully, now that you are very motivated from all the cool stuff you heard this morning, you want to learn the technical stuff. Or you already know the technical stuff. Um, in which case, please listen anyway, because maybe you'll hear a different perspective on it. Um, also, just for references, there's concise, which is great, but it's very concise. And then there's Hatcher, which is great, but it's not concise at all. And actually finding any result or definition in it can be difficult. So I generally recommend finding the same topic in both books, having them open simultaneously, and alternating. Because they're wonderful antidotes to each other, and together they work really, really well. So when you need more concision, you read concise. And when you need more floofy philosophy, you read Hatcher. And it's like you know, cold and hot water. They work great together. So OK, so um, I'm going to be talking about CW complexes and Whitehead's theorem and cellular approximation and homology and cohomology, which we can clearly cover in an hour. So um, just to start with, who knows what a CW complex is? OK, good. Uh, that means I'll do that really fast and then just to get the definition on the board. I won't even write the definition properly on the board. OK, and you know what a homotopy equivalence is? Every, raise your hand if you know what a homotopy equivalence is. Woohoo! OK, good. So we have, uh, that makes my life a lot easier. I was really worried at first. Um, OK, so I'm assuming you know what a CW complex is. And I'm just going to quickly review a couple of CW structures that are important to know off the top of your head. So the first one is a point that has a single zero cell and no other cells. The next one is Sn. And there are sort of two important structures to keep in mind about Sn. There is the version with one zero cell and one n cell. And then the attaching map from the n cell attaches the entire boundary to the zero cell. So this expresses Sn as dn modulo its boundary. And then there's another version where you take Sn minus 1, think of it as the equator, and attach two hemispheres to it. And if you do this inductively, there's a version with, it has two zero cells, uh, two one cells, and so on, all the way up to two n cells. So it has a lot more cells, but it's the same space. And these are the two important structures to keep in mind on it. Why is the second one important? Well. There's a space RPN that comes up a lot. And if you know about RPN, this is Sn modulo plus or minus 1. And with this cell structure, it doesn't give us a cell structure on here. But with this cell structure, it does because it pairs up the cells because they're all sort of opposite of one another. And so you get a single cell in dimension 0 through n. And then. If you've done this analysis, you can start to think about how to do this analysis using the fact that RPN is lines in Rn plus 1. And then you can say, well, CPN is lines in Cn plus 1. And you can do that analysis. And I'm not going to tell you how to do that, because there are some things that this lecture is far too short for. But there's a great explanation of it in Hatcher in chapter 0. Um, and this has a cell in dimension. Uh, 0, 2, all the way up to 2n. So these are the, the important CW structures that you should always know. And there's lots of other ones that are obviously important and other spaces that are important. But if you need to come up with a bunch of examples of stuff, these are a good place to start. So why do we care about these? Well, topological spaces are hard. As you know, if you've taken any points at topology, like everything has a counterexample. There's no nice overarching principle of anything. And so what kinds of spaces are nice? Well, disks are nice. And stuff that kind of looks like locally like a disk is nice. And that's one of the reasons we like manifolds. But manifolds have to look the same everywhere. And we might want to say, 
we don't want to look the same everywhere. We don't have to. A figure eight is a perfectly nice shape, even though it doesn't look the same everywhere. So we want to slightly generalize that and say, OK, well, if you are like a disk locally, that's good enough. And so you want spaces built out of disks. And that's exactly what CW complexes are. You take spaces, you build them out of disks. Anything that kind of looks locally like a disk should, morally speaking, be a CW complex. Spoiler, it is. And then we say, OK, well, can we define these up to homeomorphism? And of course, the answer is no, we can't. So we try to do something simpler, which is homotopy equivalence. And homotopy equivalence is still hard. If you take a general topological space, even if it's nice enough to be like one of these, you still can't classify them up to homotopy equivalence. So instead, we do weak equivalence. So I think you guys have seen the definition of this already, but you just had lunch, so I'm going to quickly remind you. F is a weak equivalence if pi n of F is an isomorphism for all n bigger than or equal to 0. And I mean an isomorphism in the appropriate category. So when it's a spa set, it's a bijection. Um, so yes. Thank you. Um, and yeah, anyway, so if, you, if your spaces are connected, choice of base point doesn't matter. And most of the time, we're going to be talking about connected stuff. But you are right for every choice of base point. So OK, so this is a weak equivalence. Yay. And so now the question is, can we classify spaces up to weak equivalence? And the answer is sort of. It's the same as classifying CW complexes up to homotopy equivalence. So this, this is Whitehead's theorem. Well, part of it is white has theorem. So first off, if you have a map F between CW complexes is a weak equivalence, then it is a homotopy equivalence. So if we only care about, if we really only care about these spaces and nothing else, then uh, weak equivalence is the same as homotopy equivalence. And we can start just focusing on homotopy groups and not worrying about what the difference is between weak equivalence and homotopy equivalence. And it turns out that if you only care about spaces up to weak equivalence, then studying these really is good enough. So theorem, uh, every nice space is weakly equivalent to a CW complex. And nice means compactly generated Hausdorff. Um, but pretty much it means nice. Um, and then secondly, I mean, we're talking about categories, right? In categories, if you only care about the objects, you're losing most of the data. We really need to care about the morphisms, too. And just because we know that we have a map between CW complexes, that doesn't mean it's a cellular map. And really, if you're working between CW complexes, you want cellular maps. And so the next theorem is that, well, we can do that. So if F, and this is cellular approximation, is a map between CW complexes, then it is homotopic to a cellular map. And moreover, this homotopy can be chosen to be nice. So if you have a subcomplex of X, then the homotopy, uh, so if we have a subcomplex such that F restricted to the subcomplex is already cellular, 
then we can choose the homotopy so that it's homotopy. Uh, so that it doesn't change what f is doing on a. Okay, so what's the moral of the results on the board? The moral is this. If we decide working up to homotopy equivalence is too hard and we want to work up to weak equivalence, then we only need to worry about CW complexes and we only need to worry about cellular maps. So anything nicely homotopy equivalent that we can define using cellular stuff, we should be able to define in general. And uh, because we understand CW complexes better than we understand other things, we like working with them. So for the rest of the talk, I think, uh, if there's a bit where I'm not talking about CW complexes, I'll mention it explicitly. But I'm going to be assuming that everything is a CW complex. So if I just write x and I say it's a space, I mean it's a CW complex that has a chosen CW structure on it. Um, and often we will choose that structure to be nice. Uh, no, I just assumed you knew. But I, right, raise your hand if you know what a cellular map is. OK. So actually, that definition I should review. So definition, a cellular map is one such that when you restrict it to an n skeleton, it maps to an n skeleton. That, uh, well, so f restricted to xn is a map from xn to yn. So, you know, if you can, you can look at it on skeleta. And it works perfectly nicely on each skeleton. It's not mapping any zero cell into the middle of a 557 cell. You know, they're, they're going to zero cells. Because if you, just for general map, there's no reason why that has to be the case. OK, thank you. Um, right. So this sort of means that we are in a much more combinatorial situation. But it's not quite combinatorial, right? Because there's a lot that can happen. You know, all I'm saying is that, for instance, if you map a map from Sn to Sn, then you know they're sort of with the with the top CW structure. It just means that the zero cell goes to the zero cell, so it's a pointed map. I'm not telling you anything else about the map at all. And there's a lot that can, that can go wrong there. And even more so, like let's say that we're mapping S557 to S100. I mean, again, the base point has to go to the base point, And we know nothing else about the map. So these, even though it kind of looks like you're working combinatorially, there's a lot of stuff going on there that's not combinatorial at all. Unlike if you've seen you know, simplicial homology, where maps are like really combinatorial, this is not really combinatorial at all. But it's, it's just enough combinatorial that we can do a bunch of cool stuff with it, but it doesn't lose any information. Well, so there's, right, so that's a really great question. So let's think about it. If we, if we are mapping Sn to Sn with the same dimension, then it can still say wrap around it 100 times. And that's fine. I didn't say it had to be injective. It just goes into the n skeleton. Right, so Sn to Sn minus 3. Well, that means that the n skeleton of Sn minus 3 is Sn minus 3. So it means that on the 0 skeleton, it has to go into the 0 skeleton. And then the next bit where you actually get important data is at the n skeleton. And the n skeleton of Sn minus 3 is Sn minus 3. So all that's saying is that Sn goes to Sn minus 3. There's no limits on that. Well, no, it's Yn contains all skeleta lower than it. Ah, yes, yes. Yn contains all the skeleta lower than it. It's the n minus 1 skeleton union the n cells. So there's really a lot, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. But this, does, this theorem does automatically tell us something about homotopy groups of spheres. It says, so corollary, 
if we have a map Sn to Sn plus k for k bigger than 0, uh, is homotopic to a constant map. And why is that? Well, you look at the N skeleton. You, you homotope it so it's a cellular map. And you look at the N skeleton. The N skeleton here is Sn. And the N skeleton here is a point. So the entire map factors through a point up to homotopy. So already we have shown that for Sn, all the, the lower pi i's, the pi i's that less than n, are 0 from this. Well, we have shown, meaning I have pointed you at the theorem that proves it. It's a bit circular. I agree. Um, <laughs> it's true. You're right. <laughs> we just need one more step like that, and we're done. <laughs> um, right. OK. So we have this. But as I said, there's, there's a lot of non-combinatorial stuff going on. And as mathematicians, we really want two things out of invariance. One, we want them to be invariant. For instance, if we're doing spaces up to homotopy equivalence. We want two homotopy equivalent spaces to have the same invariance. And two, we want them to be computable. And homotopy, even though it classifies things very nicely, is not really the second one of those. And so you really need, uh, you w we want something that's slightly more computable that is going to be somewhat weaker, but at least we'll be able to say more stuff. Because at this point, you know, just with this stuff, we can't say much more than this or that, regardless. But here is, um, right. so we want, an, we want a simpler invariant, and an invariant that comes with an easy computational tool. And that is what a homology theory is. It's an invariant with a simple computational tool. So there's a sort of duality between homotopy and homology in that one behaves nicely with respect to fiber sequences, and one behaves nicely with respect to cofiber sequences. But cofiber sequences are easier to understand than fiber sequences a lot of the time, which is one of the reasons that homology works somewhat better. Well, by works, I mean it's more computable. So, Let's talk about homology theories. So what is a homology theory? Well, for a long time, there was really only one, and people had different ways of defining it. And there was simplicial and singular and cellular. And they all defined the same thing. And these days, if you talk to people about homology theories, there's lots and lots and lots of them, and uh, really lots, like infinitely many. And they're all different, and it's great. Um, but there's still one we start with because it's the one that's, in a certain sense, easiest to understand. If you look up Atiyah's book, K-Theory, that book was partially written because he thought the topological K-Theory was easier than homology and that people should start with topological K-Theory. And the book is very interestingly written to be a, a textbook for people who don't know homology yet, really, and who are trying to learn a different homology theory. So it's kind of cool from that perspective. But we're going to stick with the classical perspective, and we're going to really be talking about singular, simplicial, all of these homologies. But I'm going to start with the axioms for all homology theories, and then I'll mention how you restrict yourself to a single one. And at this point, I'm going to cheat and copy off my notes. OK. So definition. So a homology theory. And I'm already kind of lying. By the way, you'll see I'll be lying a lot in these talks. Generally, if you look up what I said, it's reasonably close to the truth. But I'm very, very rarely going to be saying the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, this is a reduced homology theory. So is a sequence of functors. So little hn tilde, because these are reduced, and reduced things are always written tilde. And they go from the category of pointed topological spaces to abelian groups. Um, and I'm already somewhat lying, because I don't mean topological spaces. I mean nice things. And really, I'm only defining things for CW pairs, for CW complexes. Um, so first off, well, we wanted it 
to be able to, dis to be the same on homotopy equivalent spaces. So in that case, if two maps are homotopic, they had better be the same. We already know that, I already said functor, so we know that it takes identity to the identity. So you really want, you know, homotopy equivalences to map to isomorphisms. And for that, we need the following. So if F is homotopy equivalent to G, and these are both going, say, from X to Y, then HN of F is equal to HN of G. And exercise, if you don't know how to do it off the top of your head, check that this means that if X is homotopy equivalent to Y, then H uh, N of X is isomorphic to H N of Y. Okay, so that's the first thing we want. And then, well, the second thing we want, these are pointed, but they're not connected, and not necessarily connected, but they're also not, I mean, we want to be able to take a big space and decompose it into simpler spaces. So one thing we might want, and this is in fact something we do want, so for every wedge sum, so if x is a wedge sum of components, then Hn of x is isomorphic to the direct sum of it. And isomorphic in the way that these go. So how do you write, know that something is a wedge sum? You have a bunch of inclusions such that the, the wedge of the inclusions gives you an isomorphism, an isomorphism, and then you can apply Hn to each of the inclusions, and that gives you a map from the direct sum into the whole thing, and that should be an isomorphism. No. No, it does not. And thirdly, and this is where computability really comes in, and this is where uh, homotopy is a pro has a problem. Uh, for any CW pair, XA. So what is a CW pair? I just mean X is a CW complex and A is a subcomplex. Um, we have a long exact sequence. So we have HN of A and then we have a map including A into X. So we get a map to HN of X and then we have a quotient map from X to X mod A, so we can apply HN to that. And then the point of this axiom is that there exists this map. This is the important map. It's called boundary map, and it goes to HN minus 1 of A, and then you keep going. Now you can go back here and keep going, and this is a long exact sequence, and it keeps going forever in both directions. Notice I didn't say n was positive. It's all n. Um, and yes. Thank you. If you want to like that, we can say uh, is functors for all n in Z, if you would prefer that. Um, and these boundary maps can't just, they don't have to just satisfy, uh, they don't have to just satisfy that this is a long stack sequence, they have to work nicely with maps of CW pairs. So, and for any map of CW pairs, X A to Y B, so this means we have a cellular map from X to Y, which restricts to a cellular map from A to B. Uh, we have a commutative square, so we have Hn of X mod A, and we can map that to Hn of Y mod B via this map. We have these boundary maps, which go to Hn minus 1 of A and Hn minus 1 of B, and we have a cellular map there. 
and this commutes. So not only do these boundary maps exist in a way that glue together the exact sequence, they exist in a way that means you have maps of long exact sequences. So if you can see that that square commuting tells you that if you have a map like that of pairs, then you actually get a map of the entire long exact sequence. And that's it. That's all you need. That is a reduced homology theory. So if you want to, you can put in a dimension axiom. This is very optional. And the dimension axiom says that Hn of a point, I'll put point instead of star so as not to confuse people, is 0 for all n. This is very optional because once you put that in, there's only one. Yeah, 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 sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm only doing integer coefficients. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right, yeah. More than two hours of sleep is a good thing. Oh. No, it's so no, sorry, it's, of, it's not of S0, it's of a point, and it should be 0. Right? This is, okay, I'm going to believe you guys because, again, two hours of sleep. So then there's a theory where every space has identically 0 homology. Yes, homology. that's true. I'm going to trust you guys on this one. And then after I get more sleep, I will probably agree that you're right. Um, uh, okay, sorry, my flight was delayed and I ended up spending a night in an airport, so uh, they're there to, to be my conscience. Uh, uh, okay, so, yes, okay, and then once you do this, this is, there's only one, and it is si singular, simplicial, cellular, whichever name you want to give, it's that one. But uh, you don't have to have this. And as soon as you eliminate it, you produce the opportunity to have lots of interesting stuff. But we're actually only going to talk about this one today, because otherwise I would definitely not, if not fit into five hours. And so let's talk about how you might want to construct these. By the way, these are called the eilenberg steenrod axioms, even though Peter would probably argue with me that this is not what Eilenberg and Steenrod wrote, but this is one version of them anyway. Um, so let's construct one of these, because at this point, maybe everything is zero is the only option. Um, so, I mean, we're throwing away the optional one. We're saying, okay, that's what it is. Yay. Okay. So let's, let's actually construct something to show that there are non-trivial ones of these. So here's how we're going to do this. Um, how, if I say homological algebra, how many of you know what I mean? Okay. So uh, for those of you who are less comfortable with homological algebra, uh, Hatcher and Concise both have sections on it. I'm going to be using chain complexes and chain maps, and I'm going to write down every word that you might want to look up. And then if you are confused at the end, you should go and look up those words, and there's not that many definitions. You just need to work through them. It shouldn't take you very long. Um, but I'm not going to define them. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a chain complex C star of x for any CW complex x. And then we're going to define Hn tilde of x is going to be defined to be the nth homology of C star of x. And and the nice way of doing it in a sort of double-stepped way is that there's a bunch of stuff that you can prove 
just by, by ignoring CW complexes entirely and just working with chain complexes. There's a bunch of algebraic facts that you can prove without having to worry about the, the hard topology and geometry. So when you separate the two. And then it really becomes a thing where, okay, if you understand the algebra, plugging in the topology becomes easier. So that's one of the reasons it's sort of done in this two-step way. And also because actually proving things about chain complexes is often somewhat easier than proving things about homology. Um, so by the way, elements, so C star of X is a group, an abelian group CN of X for every N and a map D from a CN of X to CN minus 1 of X and D squared is 0. Now, writing D squared is kind of lying because you can't actually square it, but you can do D, D, and that's zero. So that's what's going on here. This is for all n. Okay. So let's actually construct this. So we're going to define Cn of x to be the free abelian group generated by n cells of x. And that gives us the groups. And now we just need to define the boundaries. And what do we want the boundaries to measure? I mean, we can just define all the boundaries to be 0, and then the homology is just the groups already. And I'm not telling you how to do homology, I suppose. Maybe I should. So Hn is the kernel of d going from Cn to Cn minus 1, modulo the image of d going from Cn plus 1 to Cn. Um, because we know that composing d with itself is 0, the image is a subset of the kernel. These are abelian groups, so it makes sense to take the quotient. OK, so if we want the the, bound, the Ds to measure something meaningful about X, they need to have something to do with the attaching maps. So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the degree of the attaching map on every n minus 1 cell in X. So here's what's happening. We know that Cn of X, so every element in here is of the form uh, some integer times an n cell times alpha n cell. So this is an, uh, the sum over all n cells. And because it's a free abelian group, all but finitely many of these are 0. So we only need to figure out what D does on a single n cell, and we've defined it everywhere. So the question is, what does it do on an n cell? Oh, I'm going to keep writing over here. So how is D defined? on a single n cell. Well, what is this n cell? It's a disk which is attached via its boundary to the n minus 1 skeleton of x. So this comes with an attaching map which goes from, S from the boundary of this n cell into the n minus 1 skeleton of x. Am I writing? Skeletus, yeah, I'm writing them a subscript. It's good. Um, so this is, uh, so this is, just the definition of a, of a CW complex. Every cell comes with one of these maps. So this is going to be a sum over n minus one cells of the degree of the map that I'm about to define times this n minus 1 cell. So what is this map that I'm about to define? Well, we have Sn minus 1, which is isomorphic in a way that is given to you to the boundary of this n cell. We have this attaching map, Xn minus 1. Now, we want to somehow pull out this cell. So what we can do is we can take the entire rest of the n minus 1 skeleton, everything that's not that cell, and collapse it to a point. Because how is the n minus 1 skeleton formed? You take the n minus 2 skeleton, 
and you attach a bunch of cells. So this cell is just sort of sitting there attached to the n minus 2 skeleton somehow. So if we collapse the n minus 2 skeleton and every other cell to a point, that makes perfect sense. So we can take this to be x n minus 1 quotiented by x n minus 1 minus this n cell, and I actually mean its interior. Um, and this is in a canonical way, because we know how this, map, how this cell sits inside x n minus 1, is also isomorphic to s n minus 1. Yes? It's topologically. It's all topologically. So inside a cell, a cell really is dn. So if you want to define it to be smooth there, you can define it to be smooth there. Alternately, you can, define, you can make things locally nice and only worry about that. And if, you, if things are nice, I don't want to deal with the, especially on two hours of sleep, I don't want to deal with the points and topological issues of this. Um, the question is, you do, we don't have, technically don't have smooth structures here, even though we kind of do on the interior of any cell. So we can, so the question is how do you define the degree? You can define the degree by making things nice enough. Um, he's saying that we don't have a smooth structure, so it's not. That's true, so we can just do it on pi n. That's, so, yeah. So we can, we can do it that way. Anyway, um, you, can, you can also, honestly, because you're sort of only working inside cells, you can kind of, kind of not really, I am totally lying right now, pretend you have a smooth structure. But um, it is a map between spheres. You can just look at what it does on pi n minus 1 here, and that'll give you the degree just as well. Um, so, or you can look at all the other ways of defining degrees and figure it out that way. Um, and so anyway, we have this map between spheres. It has a degree, however we want to define it. And that's how we define the thing. So this, is, this map is often called F alpha beta because it's how alpha is attached to the cell beta. Um, so that's what's going on. Now, I am not going to check that that actually gives you a, a chain complex. Uh, Exercise. Check that it, has, that it actually gives you a chain complex. It actually works. So we have, I mean, all you need to check is this condition. That's the only condition. So, um, OK, so I claim that this satisfies these axioms. And I'm not going to check all of them, but I will sketch a proof of one and explain a, and actually explain a proof of two. I'm not going to do three. Um, I actually don't want to erase anything, but unfortunately, if I just start writing over the top of it, it'll make things worse. Um, for one, yes. No, you just need it to be stationary. But that's just because the homotopy is a cellular map. Yeah, it's a consequence of this. Yeah. You just need to pick your nice CW structure on I. Um, ah, it's so nice when I thought about things in advance. Um, so, uh, OK. So let's, let's work with two first, because two is a slightly easier one. And one actually requires some algebra and some thought, whereas two really doesn't. What's going on with 2? Well, we have x, and it kind of looks like this. There's our base point. And every cell only hits one of these lobes. It doesn't hit multiple lobes. Um, because I'm, I'm sort of, for every lobe is one of these x alphas. 
So, you know, this is x alpha, this is x alpha prime, and so on and so forth. So every cell only hits these. So, oh, and I totally lied. I apologize. Uh, I, missed, I missed a spot on my, I need to reduce it. So for c negative 1 of x is equal to z, and the map from c0 of x to c negative 1 of x is add up coefficients. There. Now it's the correct chain complex. Um, and, okay, so c negative 1, uh, so if you actually look at what this means for homology, c0 of x to c negative 1 of x is surjective because we have at least one zero cell, I'm assuming because we have a pointed space. We have at least one zero cell, so the map is surjective, and so we're never going to have negative 1 homology. And so we don't need to worry about negatively dimensioned things. And we might need to worry about zero part, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm only going to worry about the higher part, and you guys can worry about the zero part. What's going on when we are defining the CNs? Well, CN of x is the free abelian group on n cells of x. I'm assuming that n is bigger than zero. You guys can wor worry about the zero case on your own. And this is equal to the direct sum over alphas of free abelian groups on n cells of x alpha. Because every n cell is in exactly one of them. Um, and so, great, so th we, the groups in the chain complexes are just sums of them. So if we can show that every attaching map is just a sum of the attaching maps on each x alpha, we'll be done. So how do we do that? Well, we just kind of look at what's going on on the attaching maps. So what we want to show is that if a particular n cell lives inside a given lobe, then it only attaches to cells living inside that lobe. But that's exactly what it means to be a wedge sum. I mean, your attaching maps only hit things inside you. So if uh, En, I'll call it beta, is, lives inside x alpha, um, and En gamma is not a subset of x alpha, then f sub alpha beta is constant at the base point. So that's what's going on there. And you can check this, but this is the main point of what's going on. And that's just a consequence of it being a topological wedge sum. Uh, yes, thank you. Beta again. Uh, and so in particular, you see that these degrees, well, because it's constant, the degree is zero. And so these degrees will all be zero for cells not inside x alpha. And so what will happen is that this, the map D will be a sum of the individual maps for each of the x alphas. So, so D is actually a sum of these D alphas, which are the maps in C of X, C star of X alpha. And so, well, once your groups are sums and your maps are sums, well, then your homology will also be a sum. You can, that's pretty much linear algebra. Um, and so that's what's going on with number two. So this is the proof of two. Now let's talk about one, which is really the, the one that says that this is the kind of invariant we like. So really, it's sort of the important one. Okay. So we have two maps, and we have a homotopy between them. 
because I'm only defining this on CW complexes. I already know that I'm going between CW complexes. And because I only actually define this for cellular maps, I'm actually already assuming that it's a cellular map. You, you know, how, do, how is this defined for non-cellular map with this definition? Mm -hmm. It does something crazy. So really, this is only defined on cellular maps. So the real thing that we're trying to check is that if you have two things which are cellular maps, then they're homotopic by a cellular map. And then we're going to use that cellular homotopy to do some algebra. So corollary of the theorem that's left up there is that if f and g are are cellular maps and f is homotopy equivalent to g then uh, f is homotopic to g then f is homotopic to g via a cellular map x cross i And this just works by apl directly applying this theorem. We say, okay, we have f and g, so we have, and they're homotopic, so we have a homotopy here. Right. So I has the following cell structure. We have two zero cells and a single one cell connecting them. And then the question is, how do we put a cell structure on a product? And you can probably figure it out. Um, it involves products of cells to create new cells. Um, so this is a, C a CW complex. This is a map. And when you restrict it to when it's x cross 0, well, this is f, so it's cellular. If it's, one, if it's x cross 1, then it's g, and it's cellular. So we take the subcomplex x cross 0, 1, and we apply the second part of the theorem to it. We have a nice subcomplex on which it's already cellular. So we homotope this H to a cellular map in a way that doesn't change what it is on x cross 0 and x cross 1. And so then it's a cellular homotopy. It's a homotopy which is cellular between F and G. If we didn't have the second part, we couldn't do this because we could homotope it to another map. But that wouldn't tell us it's a homotopy between F and G. It would tell us it's a homotopy between some other two cellular maps, which is not nearly as useful. OK, so we have this. It's a cellular homotopy. So now, I didn't tell you actually how to do this. This is another exercise. But how do you use this definition to actually construct, like this is a, not a functor. I defined it on an object, but I haven't defined it on morphisms. But so, so that's, that's actually a question for you. Figure out how to define on morphisms. I'll just tell you that you can and that it works properly. Um, but that's an actual thing you have to do. It's just I have 15, maybe 25, something like that, minutes left. And I have about an hour's worth of material to cover. So I'm not going to do that part. OK. So now what we have is what we have is a map from C star of x cross i to C star of y. And we know that we have inclusion here, for instance, C star x cross 0 here. That includes into here. And this composition is C star of f. Now, and similarly, you know, we have one for C star of G. What we would like is to be able to say something like this. We have, so I'll draw this, the second part of this also. So what we'd like to say is a homotopy between two maps of topological spaces is a map here that fills in this kind of big triangle. If we have if we ignore the C stars, then a homotopy between these two maps on the outside is exactly a way of filling in the, the outside so that the inside commutes. So we want to say the fact that we have this diagram and these triangles means that we have 
a homotopy between maps on chain complexes, whatever that should mean. And what should that mean? Well, what we would like, we want one to hold. So we want, we don't want these maps to be equal, but we want them to induce equal maps on homology. So the statement that we need is that if a diagram like this exists, then h star of f equals h star of g. So I'm going to give you a quick outline of how we prove this. And I'm not going to give you any of the details. Um, but this is where the phrase homological algebra comes in. Notice that at this point, we are not worrying about the spaces at all. These are all chain complexes and maps of chain complexes. And algebra, as a very good friend of mine once told me, is what you do when you don't understand geometry and need to push symbols around to make something happen. And luckily, the, this is in the world of algebra, where we can push symbols around to make something happen. And this is a purely algebraic statement. So this statement is literally symbol pushing. It's not necessarily the most obvious symbol pushing if you haven't seen it before. But it really is. You, there's a couple of new techniques for pushing symbols around, which is what is termed homological algebra. And then this statement falls out. So the important components of this is, so I'm just going to list facts at you that you can look up later if you haven't seen this before. A chain map uh, between, so we have maps F and G, to use Hatcher's notation, between just chain complexes, C star and D star. These are chain complexes. Sorry, a chain homotopy. Um, is a sequence of maps P sub n from Cn to Dn minus 1 such that, oh man, I'm going to screw this up. Uh, plus 1. Yeah, that's for cohomology. Thank you. Um, Yes, yes. Uh, so that so, S n minus G n is equal to stuff. I'm not going to remember this formula. It's called a chain homotopy. If you look it up, it'll just it's be. be it's got to be something like that. But yeah, yeah. There it is. That one I believe more. Um, okay. Okay, so that's the thing. And then the second component is that a map, uh, so given a map between C star. Uh, tensored, I'm going to call this I and D star, where C star and D star are positive chain complexes. And I is uh, Z to Z squared. And then there's zeros, and this is dimension 0, and this is dimension 1. And you need to look up tensor products of chain complexes, uh, gives you a chain homotopy. And then the third component is fiddling with the reduction. So, what's going on here? So, this, these chain complexes are not positive. I told you what happens here with positive ones, but these are not positive, they have things in negative one. But chain complexes are sort of local things. They only see things that are nearby. So 
if you want to construct this, you could play around with just the positive part and then fiddle around with the reduction, which is the bit from 0 to negative 1 later. And that's what's going on there. And these are the components to proving that. Yes? Right, so you can do that too. You love negative just the empty set. Yeah, they're, they're very convenient. Anyway, <laughs> they, don't have to be, they don't have to be pointed. They're negative one synthesis. <laughs> um, but I'm constructing reduced homology. They're not actually living there, they're a formal convenience. Um, anyway. <laughs> it actually isn't that, yeah, at this point, Peter and I are arguing about which version of reduced homology we like better. Um, so anyway, these are the components. You should look them up, maybe, if at some point you're interested. But the actual important stuff, this is the most important part for you to understand about this. Everything else is pretty much fiddling with the definition of the chain complex. But the conceptual part is that you, could, that you can split up this notion about homotopies of maps going to isomorphisms of homology into two steps, one purely algebraic and one in how to construct the algebra. So that's what's going on there. And that's how you prove one. And I'm not going to go into three at all. If you want to look it up, go look it up. There's a bunch of interesting stuff. Uh, go read about excision. Um, but uh, I'm just going to claim it works. And now let's do some examples um, because actually doing examples is important. If my advisor were here, he'd be laughing really hard because I always complained about doing examples. But anyway. So let's compute some of these. Oh, and I just erased the axioms. Oh, well. Um, hopefully, you remember them. So let's do some of them. First off, uh, we know we took the optional one, which I didn't erase. It's that a one. So we know what it is for S0. So I'll just, in fact, put it up, and then I don't have to rewrite it. So for S0, we're good. OK. So now what? Um, well, I don't actually want to do any real computations, so I'm going to do some computations. They'll give me all the spheres without having to do actual computations. So I'm going to look at axiom 3, the one that we haven't really talked about much, which gives us this sequence. And I'm going to say, OK, suppose that we have, let, so let uh, A be anything. And I'm going to let x be the cone on A. And for those of you unfamiliar with it, this is A cross I with that same cellular structure that we like, quotiented out by A cross 1. So we've taken, we've fattened it up, and then we've collapsed one bit. And if you can imagine yourself eating lots of spaghetti, that's contractible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of spaghetti. It's multi-dimensional spaghetti, but it's still spaghetti. Um, so, uh, so that's contractible. And from 1, we know that that means that uh, Hn of Ca is homotopic to Hn of a point. Uh, big Hn, because I actually defined a specific one this time. So now we just need to do Hn of a point. And Hn of a point, I can actually do. I can write down the chain complex for that one. We, we wrote down what the, exactly what the cell structure is. This chain complex is going to be awesome. It's a bunch of zeros. And then we have a z in dimension 0 because we have a single 0 cell. And then we have a z in dimension negative 1 because that's what we do. And this is adding up. And so, OK, so Hn is 0 for n not equal to 0 or negative 1. We discussed that h negative 1 is always 0. 
And so now what's h0? Well, it's the kernel of this, which is trivial, modulo something, but we are, that has to be trivial. So it's all zero. So OK, my favorite computation. Everything is zero. And now we just look at this exact sequence again, but it's infinite, so I can shift it around. So I'm going to look at it this way. I'm going to say hn of ca going to hn of ca mod a going to hn minus 1 of a going to hn minus 1 of ca. So this is exact for all n. And this is 0. And this is 0. And whenever you have an exact sequence where a map is squashed between two zeros, it's an isomorphism. So this is an isomorphism. And this is, in fact, homeomorphic to the suspension on A. And so I can never remember which one is reduced and which one's unreduced. So I'm going to claim that's unreduced. And if it's reduced, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, so we have that. And now we can plug in S0 into A. And the suspension of S0 is S1. So look, this, is, this shifts everything by 1. So we know that Hn of S1 is isomorphic to Hn minus 1 of S0. So this is going to be z when n equals 1 and 0 otherwise. And then we can just keep going. And we get that Hn of Sm is z if n equals m and 0 otherwise. Thank you. So there we go. Or you could say, uh, you know, you're being really lazy. We had a really nice, simple CW structure on Sn. Um, and you didn't have to do this, oh, I don't want to think about CW structures at all thing. You could have just said, look, we have a chain complex which is almost as easy as this one with just an extra z lying around somewhere far away from these and gotten the same answer. And you'd be completely right. Um, so there, that's a second way of getting this. Okay. So we know it for Sn. And I said at the beginning that there's three important examples for you to remember. So we're going to do the other two. And then we're going to do cohomology. Or else Agnes will be very, very upset and sad. Um, uh, I'm going to keep that up. Oh, it's, it, I actually think I'm going to get to it OK. I have five minutes? I thought I had an hour and 10 minutes. I started at 1.30. Oh, in five minutes? OK, I have five minutes. OK. I'll get, mm, OK. OK, I'll go where I go. So OK, so let's do CPN because that's the easy one. Uh, what is H, uh, HN twiddle of CP? I'll call it K to distinguish it. OK, well, this is the homology. This is HN of the following chain complex. Well, we had cells in every even dimension up to 2K. So we have a bunch of zeros, and then we have a Z, and then a 0, and then a Z, and then a 0. And then we hit, we have a 0, then we have a Z in dimension 0, and then we have a Z in dimension negative 1, and then we have a bunch more zeros. So over here, so this is 2K. There's a, there's a, there's, this is a dot, dot, dot. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Uh, that's at one. It's odd. So there's a zero. Not that sleep deprived. Um, so, okay. So everywhere above zero, we can't possibly have any, anything weird going on. Uh, yeah, all of these are zero. Because it's below negative one and I said that. Uh, the only weird one was negative one. 
So this is, again, an isomorphism because this map is adding up. So again, we're going to have a 0 in dimension 0, a 0 in dimension negative 1. And then we have, any time you have a 0, your homology is going to be 0 there. And if you have something squashed between two zeros, that's the homology there is going to be 0. So we get that this is going to be equal z if n equals 2, 4, or anything else even up to 2k, and 0 otherwise. OK. I'm out of time? Do RPN. Do RPN. I can't read lips. <laughs> um, right, so what is RPN? RPN is the hard one. We have a cell in every dimension. So HN of RPK, OK, well, this is HN of something more complicated. We have a Z in dimension K. Then we have a Z in dimension K minus 1. And then we have a z in dimension 1, a z in dimension 0, z in dimension negative 1, and then a bunch more zeros. So again, this is plus. This is isomorphism. So we don't actually worry about these. At 0 and negative 1, you're going to have 0. Pretty much any time you are connected at 0, you're going to have 0. So let's look at what's going on elsewhere. Now we actually have to worry about the formula that I erased, which is how you get the map. Because what the, I mean, there's lots of maps that this could be. This is multiplication by 57 is going to be very different than if it's 0. So what is it? Well, this is where I'm going to be fudging about degrees. But remember, we need to look at the degree of the attaching map to every individual cell. Now, luckily, we only have one cell in each dimension. So really, the question is, what is the degree of the attaching map of the n cell to the n minus 1 cell? Assume if everything was nice and smooth and we had a bunch of niceness going on, we could say the following. We look at the preimage of any point, and it's going to be a bunch of points and homeomorphic neighborhoods mapping to that point. And we pick an orientation on the whole thing, and then we get a 1 or a negative 1 at every point, because either we're flipping orientation on that preimage or we're not, and then you add all of those ones and negative ones up, and that gives you the degree. So what goes on with the attaching map? So, so I'll say, how does the mth cell attach to the m minus first cell? Well, I'm going to draw this in the only dimension I know how. So here are two zero cells which are actually one zero cell, which I'm only drawing separated because, quotient to, because I can't draw RP2. Um, here is our single one cell, as I've also drawn in two copies, because I can't draw RP2. But here is our only two cell. I'm not drawing its mirror image, because why bother? We can also think of RP2 as a hemisphere with the boundary quotiented out by plus or minus 1. So the attaching map, oh, there isn't a red, OK. So the attaching, where? OK, oh, there, indeed. So how does the attaching map work? The attaching map takes this circle around the edge of the northern hemisphere, and it attaches it along here and then back along here. But this back one is the same thing here. So we've gone here, we're back here, and then we go there again. Because what happens is that a small neighborhood here, which I'm going to orient in that direction, it's oriented counterclockwise as it ought to be, it is glued to this one in that direction, which is also counterclockwise as it ought to be. So this attaching map goes around twice. And now, I can't draw it in higher dimensions, but in higher dimensions, you think about it going the same way. The preimage of any point on this equator has two preimages in the upper hemisphere. And they are related by negative 1 to the n. Plus 1. I can't draw it one dimension down. That's true. 
the one dimension down looks like this. You have a segment and you're attaching it to two points which are actually the same point. And this one is coming out and this one is coming in. So they cancel each other out. This one doubled, this one cancels each other out. And because every time the homothety by a radius of negative one in dimension n, you know, swap sign every time you increase n by one. So every other time you're going to multiply by two and every other time you're going to cancel out. And so your chain complex here is zero, here is multiplication by two, and now we're depending on the sign of k over here. Um, so, but, it's, but I'm going to pretend it's actually infinite and we are alternating, let's say, twos and zeros and twos and zeros. And, and at some point you stop and you just truncate it there. Yes. Yeah. Um, sure, but then I can't write z mod twos underneath. So what's the homology over here? Well, the kernel here, this is multiplication by two. So the kernel here is trivial. So the homology here, so hn, n was k minus one here, is zero. On the other hand, here the kernel is everything. But the image is 2z. So this is going to be z mod 2z, which is, you know, z mod 2z. Um, and so there it is. So the homology will alternate. 0, z mod 2, 0, z mod 2, 0, z mod 2, except at the top and the bottom. At the bottom, it just stops. Um, and you get, you know, you get a z mod 2, and then you just get zeros beneath it. And then at the top, you get either a 0 or a z, depending on what order at the top, whether you have a z, uh, whether you start with the map 0, which will give you a z at the top, or if you start with a map multiplication by 2, which gives you a 0 at the top. And then, you know, beyond that, it's 0. OK, so I don't have time for cohomology. Anyway, that's it. Questions? Yes. For for bounded th for things that are bounded below, for things that are negative, it's weird, but yeah, it's an equivalent definition. Um, does it? Yeah. Okay. Then it's just equivalent. I always thought. Okay. Okay. Um, I only have approved it for bounded ones, so I never checked it for anything else. Uh, so. Anyway, so yeah, so it works. Um, in fact, whenever you see diagrams like this, a homotopy is this map. That's what a homotopy is. If you have a definition that doesn't agree with the diagram picture, the definition is wrong. The, the diagram is morally correct. Um, and that, that's actually, in general, like a natural transformation is a diagram like this, too. And like, that's the correct notion of homotopy. Yeah.